After August, as if by magic, September appeared, ushering in a perplexing new vehicle for Noel Edmonds, which started off sounding like a political rally. Are you unhappy with life in Britain today? Yeah. Are you concerned with the lack of respect, compassion and freedom in our society? Yeah. Would you like to be part of a fairer, more caring Britain? Yeah, and I'll kill anyone who disagrees. You clearly feel frustrated and at times angry at the tidal wave of new rules, regulations and laws that have been introduced in the name of health and safety, security or the environment. Oh yeah, bloody health and safety and security and the environment. I hate them. Well, the politicians, they've had their turn. Yeah, it's an uprising. Come on. It's down to you, me, them and everyone who wants to live in a more caring society. Is it going to involve any work? The show itself was essentially a combination of That's Life, Surprise, Surprise and the scenes where Peter Finch goes mad in network. Half of it consisted of heartwarming acts of kindness to worthy causes, which is nice, but the other half was pure post-breakdown Alan Partridge as Noel, assisted here by Peter Cushing, grumbled about bloody red tape and tutted over small-minded local council policies. Busking bagpipers from one of Scotland's most famous streets in Edinburgh were made to sign acceptable behaviour contracts. Re <laughs> no, come on, restricting their playing times due to rules on licensing and noise. Well, that sounds quite reasonable to me. I mean, you don't want bagpipers playing late at night, so... Uh... Why are the police going after bagpipers? Why aren't they going after the yobs and the hoodies and the drugs? <laughs> oh, yeah, I hadn't seen it like that. Yeah, kill the hoodies and the drugs. Just to underline how bloody typical all these council officials are, Noel introduced the most embarrassing studio sequence ever. <laughs> I reckon my, uh, I reckon my favourite program of the year, right, was that probably that ITV2 thing with like all those celebrities on on, a, on an aeroplane, Celeb Air or something like that. I think it was called. Like you actually got to see how like Chico coped with like being on a plane serving peanuts, and looking at luggage and stuff. It was fucking genius. It was like the actual Chico. Every time the plane took off, I was praying that it wasn't going to crash. Like literally on my knees praying, like. No, God, don't you dare kill that aeroplane. I don't think the nation could cope without this show. You know, actually, if they had crashed, I think, you know, they could have kept the cameras running and, you know, filmed everyone lying around dead in a field with all the bodies going all mushy, and it might have even been better. Some job titles lost a lot of their value throughout 2008. Jobs like stockbroker or estate agent or TV judge. The panel of self-important TV judges has been a staple of TV talent contests for a while now, but this year the position seemed so wildly oversubscribed it seemed any f***er would do in more or less any role. I mean, I can just about see the virtue in letting snail-faced human smug swamp Piers Morgan decide whether the contestants on Britain's Got Talent have actually got talent. Because A, none of them have, so you need a champion bullshit to help fill the embarrassing gap. And for representing every hard-working mum in Britain, I love you. And B, he's sitting next to Amanda Holden, so even if he did nothing but go the whole time, he'd seem overqualified by comparison. But the madness surely has to stop when The Underdog Show, a cheap and cheerful canine talent contest in which megastars train abandoned dogs to perform tricks, invites ballroom dancer Brendan Cole to sit on the judging panel. What's he got to do with dogs? Apart from being able to lick his own balls, of course. Then there's the traditional interjudge rivalry, which stopped looking like something out of a pantomime and started reeking of genuine animosity instead. There were heated exchanges on Strictly Come Dancing. Don't Start be on at me. Don't get you on just give it negative. You never give us a positive, and you get on my wick. Harsh words on Britain's missing top model. You didn't have to deal with it quite like that. You can't say it because you're scared of offending people. And I do feel, Wayne, well, that you're very, very scared of offending people yeah, and saying not, certain yeah. things because you want to make yourself look good. No, oh, well, that's a story. And to be honest, it really sucks. So that's what you do. You're a This is what I was just. That's what I'm 
Well, on the X Factor, Louis Walsh's playground accusations of song theft... Danny, you did lick their song, but it doesn't matter. They were fantastic. ...even reduced Danny Minogue to sobs. I would never, ever steal anyone else's song I had. At least that proves her tear ducts are still human, even if the rest of her face looks like it's been beamed into position from the planet Plastulon. This was all so dramatic, it left Dermot O'Leary confused as to who was meant to be performing what for who. What did you make of it, hon? What did you make of the judges' performance, uh, uh, the I, comments and your performance? I appreciate the comments. Still, being underqualified or over-theatrical isn't necessarily a death sentence for a TV judge, provided you remain in touch with public opinion. Well, epic fail on that front. Throughout the year, telly judges and the great unwashed simply didn't see eye to eye. First, Andrew Lloyd Webber sulked about their voting decisions on I'd Do Anything. First, I'm going to say this is a complete and utter travesty. Neither of you should be in the bottom two. And do you know what? For the first time on any television show, I'm angry. And I am angry. Well, go on, show it. Kick over a chair or something, you f***ing swamp monster. Then Louis Walsh shut up a storm by hoofing sad face songstress Laura White off the X Factor, prompting angry petitions from literally thousands of idiots. Most conspicuously of all, the public revolted against the Strictly Come Dancing panel's treatment of John Sargent. Even you have to admit that your dancing stinks. <laughs> they kept him in the running for so long, he wound up resigning, sending the entire country completely bloody mad for about 19 minutes. All in all, throughout 2008, being a telly judge must have been about as much fun as swallowing handfuls of cat fur and paint for a living, which is, weirdly, the number one pastime in Belgium. In chilly October, a whirlwind of controversy erupted over the Jonathan Ross-Russell brand prank calls, prompting a debate about decency in comedy, which led to this weird Newsnight moment in which Emily Maitlis regaled BBC DG Mark Thompson with lines from Mock the Week. I'm now so old, my pussy is haunted. Oh, Kerry Katona on this morning, eh? That was hilarious. Just because he was, uh, like, in a girl band and did those ice and ads, I reckon I've got every right to put all human decency aside and just sit around and laugh at any bad thing that happens to her. Watching her, slurring her words and being all confused, I pissed myself. What addition would that be? Well, is this alcohol? No, not at all. I'm on holiday in Spain. You know, I'm allowed to have a drink, can't I? Because, like, nothing's more funny than someone suffering or going through some sort of harrowing breakdown, is it? Cracks me right up. November, an election fever grips the world as Bracco the Wonderboy is elected President of the United States. Although, sadly, the moment of victory was soured slightly for Jesse Jackson when someone in the crowd stood on his toe making his eyes water in this heart-rending clip. The BBC celebrated by holding a live grudge match between respected yet palpably crazy author Gore Vidal and unruffable anchorman David Dimbleby. May I talk the facts of life to you? Uh, uh, I, the BBC audience I know very well, and they like the facts of life. Are you saying you thought that there would be dirtier tricks played in this campaign than materialised in reality? Is that what you're saying? I don't know what you're saying that I'm saying. Would you do it again? Yes, I'm saying in order to remain in power, to uh, pull tricks during this campaign, which in the end didn't materialise. I hinted at that, I hinted at that, I thought you would take the hint and not take it as a statement of reality. Why shouldn't I take it as a statement of reality? I don't know why you would, because I don't know who you are. I'm a Celebrity, ITV's fun collision of insect eating and backbiting came back again with a fresh cast of celebrity ones. Here's some solace if you think you've had a bad year. Consider Brian Paddy. Back in April, he was on Newsnight, standing shoulder to shoulder with some of the nation's top politicians. Fast forward a few months later, and he's glugging liquidised kangaroo penis with Timmy Mallet. So if you've had a rubbish 2008, well, at least you're not him. November also brought about Survivors, the BBC's reimagining of Terry Nation's mid-70s series of the same name. And it's exactly like the original in every way, apart from the casting, pace, execution and overall tone. The story takes place in a contemporary Britain that's been afflicted by a deadly flu-like pandemic that suddenly renders people lazy. So lazy they couldn't even be bothered to breathe and would rather lie around looking floppy and frightening people. Actually, the show couldn't quite make up its mind how the disease worked because some people got sick and sweaty and deteriorated slowly, while others looked perfectly healthy until the final moment when some kind of invisible deadline kicked in and they all died together in serene solidarity. 
See, say what you like about us British, we're punctual and we're clean. None of this shitting out our internal organs in a screaming, blubbering heap for us. No, we just laid down and died in neat piles. I bet France was a f***ing toilet. As you've just seen, not everyone died, which is just as well, because otherwise the series would have starred two cockroaches and a deer or something. 1% of the population survived the bug, although not without suffering a few curious side effects. Max Beasley's character, for instance, was left with a sort of intense brooding squint which kicked in every five minutes, leaving him unable to talk. While Zoe Tapper's Dr. Thingamajig had her entire personality wiped out by the virus. Worst of all, Julie Graham, playing Abby Grant, suffered some kind of bizarre mental damage, which turned her into an irritating huffy mum figure who kept whining on and on and on about going to find her poxy son Peter, who we'd never actually seen, so we didn't give a toss about. I have to find Peter now. I'm looking for my son, Peter. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I saw him a second ago. He was heading that way, somewhere off the screen somewhere. Why don't you go and look for him? I sometimes know when I think of Peter. I can't remember his face. Oh, good start. Now work on forgetting his f***ing name. Anyway, Abby and co are strikingly middle-class survivors. The virus has largely wiped out Britain's working classes, apart from one or two who've been turned into implausible villains, sort of chavs from hell. What are we having? because we like you. Lenny really likes you. You go first, then I'll join you. Anyway, with most of Britain's bin men and bus drivers lying inconveniently dead and the rest gone feral, the entire infrastructure has collapsed, which means our middle-class survivors quickly learn they'll have to go all Ray Mears to survive. We're going to have to relearn the skills we've forgotten. We've become like helpless babies. Pushing the buttons of our fancy technology whilst distancing ourselves further every day from the reality of what it actually is to be human. Huh? Anyway, as the series progressed, it settled into a sort of half-good, half-bad groove. On the one hand, there was lots of agreeably bleak post-apocalyptic horridness to enjoy. And on the other, there were regular concessions to regulation BBC cosy chummy niceness, which sometimes left the band of survivors looking more like the f***ing Oxo family. December saw The X Factor wail its way towards a climax, as viewers were treated to more heightened emotion than you'll find at a thousand Italian weddings. Owen Quigg made a particular arse of himself when Diana Vickers got the heave-ho, reacting like a four-year-old whose puppy's just been stolen by an evil tree monster in a haunted forest, throwing himself at her again and again and again, sometimes before she'd finished singing. Ooh, you know, I've had nightmares where that crying is just running at me with his arms outstretched and his face all sobbing like that, just running and running and running at me and running and running and running and running. And running. On the night of the final itself, after a number from five years' worth of rejected auditionees that was meant to be comic but came across more like a musical version of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, the tears started flowing again as eventual winner Alexandra sang disbelievingly alongside Beyoncé, managing to look like a woman having a breakdown imagining she was singing with Beyoncé, if you see what I mean. God, you've made my dreams come true. <laughs> Why is this the end of the Poseidon adventure? Of course, it all ended happily when she pulled herself together enough to win over the nation with a stirring cover of the Leonard Cohen song, Hallelujah. <laughs> Which has now been ruined forever as a song destined to be played at thick people's funerals. Uh, you know, the best thing that happened in 2008 was the news went truly interactive. <laughs> Try dodging this one, you f So that was 2008. Next year is going to be called 2009, by all accounts. All that remains for me to say is Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Yeah, go away. Oh, and finally, just to annoy the continuity announcer, we're going to childishly roll our end credits over some footage of a bottom in front of a microphone so you can imagine it speaking if they decide to talk all over it. <laughs> Yes, Merry Christmas to you too, Charlie, but you're forgetting. We can squeeze it and you won't feel a thing. Ignoring all warnings to the contrary now and unearthing the past, Ben strays into the best forgotten world of Geep Manor in the final part of Crooked House. Next.